From the outside looking in, it can sometimes appear that peak performers have an elusive talent or skill that sets them apart from the rest of us. However, what usually sets peak performers apart isn't what they can do, it's what they will do. You are listening to the Trading Edges podcast, the podcast dedicated to seeking and sharing the best ideas and principles from peak performers across all domains of performance and achievement to help you discover your full trading potential. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, this is Houston, and welcome to the fourth episode of Trading Edges, brought to you by thetradingedge.org. And in this interview today, I catch up with seasoned futures trader Brad Jelinek. Like I said, Brad's a seasoned trader, and he's focused predominantly on trading the S&P futures, although he occasionally dabbles in fixed income and currency futures. Just a bit of background on Brad. Upon graduating from the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a degree in business finance, Brad landed an opportunity to trade at one of Chicago's top trading firms. And since then, he's moved on to become an independent trader. So let me share with, with you a bit about the interview. There's tons to unpack here, and there's some really big ideas. First off, Brad, Brad shares what it feels like to turn five thousand dollars into a hundred thousand dollars and then lose it all he talks about the adaptive process of being a trader the best time of day to trade how brad got into meditation what he learned after a 10-day meditation retreat the importance of meditation in movement throughout the day and the three most common mistakes that traders make and i'll give you a hint Number one, the unwillingness to adapt. Number two, being the herd and trying to pick tops and bottoms. And three, poor risk management. And finally, Brad shares his method on how he journals his trades. And we wrap it up by talking about a great lesson he picked up from Roger Federer. Now, there's a lot more to unpack there, but I just wanted to give you a sneak peek. Once again, thanks for listening to the show. And as always... We'd love to hear your feedback. So drop us a line or leave us some positive feedback on iTunes to help others find the show. Now, on to the interview. Hey, Brad, how are you doing today? Hey, Houston, doing good. Great. I'm happy to get a chance to talk to you. Actually, always fun to talk to you. So uh, how's trading going today? Oh, it's okay today. I'm in a different location. Um, and sometimes when you, when you make switches in trading it, to your environment or as traders know, even if a few screens get moved or your workspace changes, it, it can cause uh, a little bit of internal unrest. So I'm, I've noticed that happening with me a little bit this week because I'm in a different location. So I kind of had to just be aware of that. It caught, right. it caught, up, with me. It caught up with me a little bit today. <laughs> Are you telling before the call that you're in in beautiful sunny Florida, so I, I can't be too uh, <laughs> right sympathetic. <laughs> right, that's okay. Uh, so um, before we get started, I want to why don't we just uh, give the audience just a bit of background about you? You know, you and I have had just talk before, but uh, why don't you tell us our, your story? So tell us about your trading background, maybe your approach to trading, and just you know, kind of how you got started. Yeah, sure. I'm 34 years old right now, and I I think I really got into this stuff professionally when I was around 21 or 22, but even in junior high, as early as then, um, I just, I grew up in northern Wisconsin, um, and there wasn't a lot of trading stuff around there. Um, I live in Chicago now where there is a lot of stuff uh, about the market, but, so it's kind of weird that I got into it from that area, but I did, and I think, I guess the first thing I remember is uh, a gym teacher, like a Phi Ed class we had to take. He was always checking stocks, and I thought it was fascinating. You could make money by watching these tickers move up and down. And, and that was, oh, I don't know if I was like 16 years old or something. And that kind of started the whole thing. And then from then on, in high school, when I went through high school, they had the 
the year 2000, uh, 98, 99, 2000, when the, U.S. tech stocks just took off, and then we had that big yeah. crash after. So I was trading in my study hall in high school, trading these tech stocks, and I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even know. What, I've never even heard of a retracement. You know, I just had no <laughs> idea. I, would, I was on message boards and finding the hottest things, and I was, I think I had like five grand in an account, and I took it to 100000 with no clue what I was wow. doing. Momentum buying. And then I lost pretty much all of it because I had no risk management principles, and I didn't figure out that we went into a bear market. So that was kind of something I went through in high school, but I was hooked at that point. So then I... So did it take you longer to, to make the money or lose the money? Lose the money? <laughs> um, it was probably about the same amount of time, actually. Um, yeah. It, you know, the market had switched, and I having really no skill set in bull market, bear market, in, in technical training and just understanding fundamentals that, you know, things that you learn as, you, as your career progresses. And yeah. So it's... I probably made more money than I should have because I was such an idiot at the time with no skill set, <laughs> uh, a young yeah. kid just throwing money at things that, uh, and you know, that it can go both ways, and it certainly did. Huh. And so what lessons did you learn from that? Um, what's the most kind of, you know, top of mind lesson that you learned from that situation? Well, you know, I don't take a whole lot from it in terms of, you know, you can look at it and say, well, you made a lot of money, then you lost it all, so you're, you aren't a good risk manager and all those things. That's all true. Yeah. But to me, yeah. to me, it was just, it was the beginning. It, was, it, was, mm. it didn't matter that much because it was me as a young kid getting started. And, yeah. getting excited. and that was just, that laid the groundwork for learning those, like, okay, let's figure out now what you don't know. You realized, and you went through this stuff, how, how do you manage your risk? How do you figure yeah. out when the market changes? And and that's kind of, uh, that's the biggest lesson, I think, was just building, okay, let's learn the foundation now. So it sounds like it kind of ignited your passion even more, right? It didn't scare you away from the markets. You kind of wanted to, to dive even deeper. Is that right? Absolutely, because you see all that going yeah. on. And, you, and you, you know, it, you, live, you live through that kind of stuff, and it's like, it's, it's life experience and that you can't replay, you can't read about that. You have to feel it. And feeling yourself, you know, fight a market that's not going up anymore. And, and yeah. And, and I felt what that was like, and, you know, it stuck with me. That's cool. And so, yeah, you, you hear stories like that, and sometimes you hear that people get gun-shy after losing a lot of money like that. Do you think, did you carry any of that kind of gun-shyness afterwards, or because maybe you were young, it didn't create that kind of strong emotional, um, you know, reaction? You know, I didn't really carry it at all because I was so young. And <laughs> eventually, cool. you know, I went through college and just did my studies as soon as I could, and then I was trained, uh, on, you know, on the side in college. And then when I got out of college, I got hired at a prop firm, which I had been with in my entire life, my work, entire working life for 12 years, and I just actually left that to go on my own about a month ago. Um, so when I got to the prop firm, then I kind of, I was around other traders who were successful, and I got a little bit of education, and I was able to find some mentors. So that was really the beginning of my education. Um, I, so I had the driving, burning passion from the beginning, and then now I fell into a situation where I had the resources, the people, and kind of the infrastructure, the risk management to really build on and develop that passion. So that's very powerful. And so nowadays, what is your approach? So that prop firm that, uh, where you cut your teeth and, and spent many years, uh, was that a predominantly uh, you know, a futures prop firm, stock, options, or did it do it all, or what was the, the approach and what do you do now? Yeah, it was mostly futures. Um, you know, did a lot of pay attention to news and events. Um, how does the market reacting to economic data? What kind of data would be a surprise? Um, mm. You know, some central bank events, press conferences, um, a lot of that stuff. And then just also just trading the moves during the day, you know, learning when it's slow to sit out, when it's busy, you know, I'm there earlier, I stay later. And then, you know, we'll get into later all the things about balancing your life around this, but, you know, yeah. recording my screen, watching the big moves over to see how they looked, keeping track of charts, saving them, tagging them, you know, searching certain types of trades, and building a style um, yeah. by I imitating some other people who were successful, but also using what I liked and then starting to make my own style. Hmm. And that's very nuanced because sometimes, it's, you know, it seems like, People are taught that they just need to, to, you know, find one setup and just stick that like to that exact setup, exact setup mechanically. But it sounds like what you're saying is like, no, there's a lot of personal nuance. Um, you kind of need to make it your own. Is that right? Well, there is. I mean, it's you, you see so many people who are successful, and then you see so many more who aren't. 
So there's you know big numbers on both sides, but it's almost like there's a million ways to make money, but there's a billion ways to lose money. So <laughs> it's uh, it's very hard. But you, what you do is you find something that works. Um, ideally, in the beginning, you find one little thing. That's what I always did. Is you know I'll give you an example. In the beginning, yeah. I think it was about I don't know ten years ago now, but you know retracements, Fibonacci retracements. Everybody's heard of those. And a lot of times, it would, say it would come up to an area and it would be a 38% and a 50% retracement. So I knew people would yep. be selling there. So I would see it come up there, and then I would see it go off. So people would sell there, and they, they were up money. And then it would come up again and come off. And then all of a sudden, it would act really strong. And the third time, it would blow through and make a big move up. So I started mm. realizing that everybody's looking at these same things, and when it doesn't yep. work, everybody's stuck, and there's a big trade the opposite way. And that was one yeah. little trade I used to do, and that kind of was my go-to trade. And then over the years, it's changed, and... You know, there's computers in the market and it doesn't seem to work. But that that kind of stuff was kind of those things were how I built tools and I would keep adapting and, and so that that was an example of something like that. No, that's a that's a great that's a great example of that. And so talk about what you're doing nowadays. Are you still trading um like what's your approach nowadays? So can you give us an example of, you know, uh, the type of setups that you take and maybe just maybe the time frames that you look at. Right, yeah. I mean, it's constantly, it's funny because it constantly is an adaptation process. It, mm. You're a trader who survives, you know, 10, 20 years. What, what you're basically doing is you're a problem solver, and you're looking at it, and you're also, and the other thing you are now more than ever, I believe, and I'm a discretionary trader, not a quantitative trader. So it, I end up having to be a really good risk manager. So yeah. now I find myself scalping less than I used to because of all the computerized trading. It's been very difficult to scalp as much unless there's maybe a surprise news event or something or a lot of volatility. So what I'm doing is I'm waiting, I'm trading less, and I'm trying to find events or things that, you know, a number's coming out. What way would the number be a surprise? If it does surprise, does the market react the way it's supposed to react? If it does or doesn't, it sets up a whole basket of trades that I can work off of that day and, you know, things like that. And I'm constantly retooling and looking at when those things don't work, what can I find that is working? And when things don't work, I have to cut my size. I have to kind of reassess and do it all over again, just like that original example of the trade I used with the retracements when I first started. It's constantly a process of figuring those things out, and it can be painful sometimes, but you get yeah. a lot of personal growth, you know, when you do that. Yeah, it's, that's so true. And so how on top of that do you have to be? Like, do you have, like, a process where you're, you, you would, like, review your trades on, you know, on a weekly basis just to see if they're still effective on, you know, on a two- or three-day basis? Like, just how, you know, fine-tuned do you have to be with, the, with your adaptation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, sometimes when I'm fluttering around a lot, I'll make a list of very simple lists. You know, one side of the paper will say what is working, and the other side will say what isn't working. And I'll write down simple things, that statements, that uh, trades that I've tried that are or aren't working because the market constantly changes. And the tools yeah. that you developed that worked years ago, they will work again, just maybe not right now. And yeah. you know, an example of that would be I used to press and add to my winners a lot, and that was a big part of my strategy. And the last four or five years, it just – that is – if you get a good spot and you do that, generally speaking, you ruin, I think a lot of people can relate to this, you'll ruin that original spot and you don't get paid mm. for doing that. Well, in the past, yeah. that was the, one of the best things I did. And I think that will come back again. Um, you know, if we had the fundamentals that, that make a market move one way aggressively, but right now, it's not. So to answer your question, I'm kind of retooling every day. Every day I have a journal and I'll write down kind of what I did and I'll remember the next day, you know, what was or wasn't working. And then over maybe once a month or so, I'll kind of look at everything and just kind of assess how I've been doing. And if something that was working a few months ago is definitely not working, then it's time for me to, to go back and see, can I come up with another trade? Is there a mutation of the trade? You know, if I was yeah. doing a certain break, a breakout trade, is it now, does it work the opposite way? Does it not work yeah. at all? You know, is there something I can find out from my trade that used to work for, for a new trade? And, uh, you know, is data working? Is the market responding to data? Like right now, the stock market, S&P futures, they don't make a lot of sense on the data. Um, yeah. However, the fixed income futures and the currency futures, they do. So I'm trading those more on the data, and that will change mm. also. 
And so tell us there, so which instruments are you trading? Sounds like ES, uh, fixed income futures? Yeah, Any other S&P instruments? futures. Yeah, S&P futures are my main, they're always in my main product, the Euro stocks futures, S&P futures, sometimes looking for divergences and correlations between the two. Um, okay. But six, fixed income and currencies uh, on the data, and sometimes during the day a little more lately. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't trade a lot of things. It sounds like I do, but I'm mostly trying to trade equity futures. However, it, it makes sense, I feel, to find times the, the other ones are also good to trade. Like on data right now, they make more sense say, in the other markets, so that's what I'm doing. But in the beginning, I kind of started with one thing, and I slowly branched out over the years to learn those specialty situations to use other products. Uh-huh. Like I'll trade corn and soybeans on the crap reports, but I don't trade yeah. them during the day. Yeah. And could you do you have like a basket of setups that you look at that you that you use on a daily basis? Is it like three, five, ten setups that you have in your arsenal or how would you describe how many setups you keep around? I mean, I the way I would kinda of look at it is I wouldn't know if I had a number of setups, but I would more look at it like this, is that when, you, when you're looking at a market, I'll try to get a fundamental overview of if I feel like it's moving a certain way because it's something I can pin my finger on fundamentally. And a lot of times that, if you're trading on a short-term chart, the fundamentals can be not important over a few hours. But still, I want to know if, that, if there's a fundamental reason. And once, once I have that, then I'll yeah. break it down to the technicals and I'll say, okay, I want to get long for these fundamental reasons let's wait until they take out the stops maybe from yesterday's low and then there's a stochastic or a MACD divergence and then I'll look to buy. You know, things yeah. like that. Um, but at the same time, you know, each day there's often a story. Like I'll give you an example. For the, yeah. the other day in, in the oil market, we had a kind of a surprise Iran deal overnight where they have a nuclear agreement you probably saw. And oil broke like 70 cents or something like that on the, on the news overnight. And during the day, you started to see oil, it, it broke below a 60-minute low, and then it, all day you just start to see strength. Um, and it started to set up really bullish consolidations and continuation moves, and there were targets above. And that's something that I started looking to buy oil and working spots when there was a technical divergence, a bullish divergence to get law and oil. Because fundamentally I'm thinking, well, there's this Iran deal. I know it's not that big of a thing, but it should be negative for the market, and the market is going straight up all day. So uh, odds are I'm pretty safe to buy pullbacks from the long side. So that's kind of the theme I work with. And each day you often get a new theme like that, yeah. and that will set up a lot of my trading. So, you know, it'll be day to day. When it's slow like it is now, you might not get as much. So, you know, you protect yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I know you've spoken and I've heard you speak in the past about how you create that narrative. And I kind of I guess that sounds like you kind of create like a bit of a um, – like some extra confidence because you're kind of going in the direction of you think uh, you know the kind of the macro picture, right? The bigger, the bigger story, and so my, you can my just favorite, kind of layer your yeah. Right. I mean that my favorite kind of trading would be when I have fundamental news or the market not reacting as it should to fundamental news, and then we start mm. to get te- technical patterns that validate yeah. my story or the lack of story or whatever it's doing, and then I get you can get a lot more aggressive. You can trade bigger because you feel like hey, people are caught the wrong way because they think it should be going up based yeah. on this data, but it's not going up. So, you know, and it doesn't have to be data. It can be something else. Yeah. You know, Fed, Fed speakers saying things that we're not moving the way we should, you know, Iran, oil deal. We had an unemployment report, you know, a few months ago that was really strong and the stock market sold off all day, stuff like that. I'm working set yeah. sales all day. You know, those kinds of things. And so... What are the hours that you keep then when you trade? Do you trade all day or do you – and then typically how many trades do you put in a day? Is there like an average that you, that you typically trade? Yeah, um, that's really evolved over time. I mean, when I first started, it was – I would get in at 5.45 a.m. Central Time and I would leave at 3.30 Central Time in the yeah. afternoon. And, and it was, you know, constant work, constant uh, market action. But – as you go along, you just learn that that's not sustainable. At least not for me, at least. I mean, when it's busy, you'll see me there those similar hours to that. But you have to pick your spot. So generally, I'm always in at 7 a.m. Central to about noon or 11 o'clock. And then a lot of times, I'll just poke, poke my head in in the afternoon to see if there's anything going on. If there's not, 
uh, I'm done. And if it's busy, you know, we go into a recession, the VIX is high, I'll trade longer. But the reality is the U.S. is one developed market. You know, Canada is one market. But if you look yeah. at it, the crossover between Europe and the U.S., well, now you have a lot going on. You have two large markets open. Or yeah. in, in, in European hours, you have Asia in Europe. So when you're sticking around in the U.S. afternoon, you know, it's a tougher trade because you have one thing open. It's quite computerized. Yeah. It's right. It's painful sometimes because there's, yeah. it's t- tougher to get an edge. And do you ever trade the last hour of the day? Does that ever, you, does that ever appeal to you? Do you find things more exciting the last hour? Not exciting, but do you, do you find things um, like m- do more opportunities in the last hour of the day or is that doesn't affect you? I mean, you? some years, 2008, 2011, I, I did. Lately, I really have not. Um, I know yeah. the opens have gotten a lot of moves this last year. Uh, I don't trade a lot in the first 10 minutes on the open, but I mean, maybe it's something that I'm looking at more to try to figure out how, how to, why are those moves happening. Um, I, yeah. I, I usually like to wait and have the market set up a little bit before I get active, get a feel for it. I think, mm-hmm. um, I think it's important to just kind of keep evolving your hours and everything else. You want like a stable set of hours, but to keep evolving with how things play out. Like the last couple of years, it's been a European trade. I mean, I have friends at other mm-hmm. uh, firms who trade, and the, the guys in, the, in, Europe, in Europe are they're doing better because they have all that action overnight, and they have the U.S. Yeah. session, and you're getting headlines and grease and, and things that create volatility. That, yep. And when you're a U.S. or Canadian trader, you wake up in the morning, and it's already done, and then you, you face, you know, and that'll switch. In 2008, it was the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. And so how do you then... Um, I guess, you know, because I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I, I know uh, when I first I heard you, I heard you on another show, Anthony Crudelli's show, and um, what really struck struck me when I heard you speak was just like, and you kind of mentioned it right, just your focus on, on you know, uh, I guess the right word would be, I'd say longevity. So I know you, you have a big focus around health and well-being. So that obviously influences, like, how you, how you spend, how much time you spend in front of the screens and how you, how you, Focus yourself. So, talk. Can you talk to me about you know what do you do to kind of decompress and kind of manage the um, the stress of trading? And that's a, a huge question that I had to ask myself. Is if you want to do this for you know a few decades, you have to do it in a certain way. I, I don't think anyone can go from you know their early twenties like I did until they're fifty and stare at the screen all day and sit in a chair. Yeah. It's just it's not. It's very unhealthy. It's not. It's not a balanced life. So what I've done is I got into meditation morning and night and did a few uh, meditation retreats. Um, I got into yoga um, three or four days a week, lifting weights, um, which I've always done a little bit of, making sure I go on walks every day. In the middle of the day, I go on a walk for 30 or 45 minutes. And I feel like that clears your head. It resets you, and it takes, it takes the pressure off you to... You just need to reset things. If you're staring at a screen all day and you're sitting down, it's you were made to move, you were made to stand up. And I just think that, it, it, it clear, I can't tell you how many times I've come back and maybe shaken the emotional you know, cloud I had on me from a losing morning mm-hmm. or even turned the day around or even decided that it's okay, maybe you just shut it down today. But without yeah. that perspective, I mean, I used to sit on my wallet, which is terrible for your back, uh, <laughs> hunched over, you know, hunched over in front of my screen, drinking, having a coffee every two hours. And I mean, that's, <laughs> it's funny, but I just, I don't do that stuff anymore. And I think that's going to keep me going a lot longer. And it helps me detach. When I go on a walk, I just realize, hey, there's other people in the world. They're doing other jobs. And it's not just about you and your trading. And that's a good perspective to have because, Otherwise, you get so caught up in your little world and your trading and you get so happy when you do well and so miserable when you don't do well. And mm. it's, just, it's just not – the faster you can get out of that, the better off you'll be. Ah, so powerful. And I couldn't agree more with that. There's, there's so many gems in there where you just said. So, so was there a, a certain moment that gave you that realization that said, hey, wait, I just can't keep going like this? Or is it kind of just a slower you know, just realization that, hey – I kind of want to be doing this for a long time. I need to change my approach. Yeah, that's a good question. I've always wanted to do it for a long time, and I wanted to do it since I was a little kid. So 
I never never thought about not doing it, but with, I, I did do a 10-day meditation silent retreat. I've done two of them, but the first one I did was a few years ago. And when I came back from that, it was kind of an eye-opener in terms of just what it felt like to totally detach. Yeah. And I realized that I was thinking to myself, like, hey, look at – Look at what's out there. Look at the peace you can have within you and look what everybody else is doing and they're so worked up about their world just like you are with yours when you're trading every day and that's all you think about. And that detachment, that sense of... So that's how I started my meditation practice after the retreat. I started doing it morning and night and what happened was it was just like... It was just this break in my day. And, and at, very, at the very least, it's a break from the, the thinking about your trading or the thinking about yourself or your worries. Mm. And that, I started to just really enjoy that, and now I look forward to those walks, and I consider those as important as anything else I'll do in my trading days, just getting that stuff in. And it started to be a slow creep. To answer your question, there wasn't a moment where it all changed. It just kind of started creeping that way, and I thought, I can do this for a long time if I can detach from it and kind of just treat it as a, a fun process where it's a, it's a game, it's a puzzle, and I, when it doesn't work, I cut my side, I readapt, I find what does work, and then I move on to the next day. And then, you know, I do something physical, I do something mental, something spiritual, and something, you know, social where I see people. If I do that every day, I feel really good, I feel balanced. If I just sit at my screen all day, I feel miserable. I, did, it's, I yeah. just don't feel good. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's, and I'm going to get more into your routine because I'd love to hear more about that in a few mm-hmm. moments. But, man, it's... it's I couldn't agree more with what you said there. Like, I think sometimes as traders, we just think like we're these little brains that are kind of like hovering on top of these little bodies that are slowly, <laughs> you know, slowly shrinking because they're sitting, sitting around all day. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Just having, you know, the opportunity to move around and, and, and kind of re, re, re nourish your body by, by moving and, 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 uh, meditating. Uh, yeah, I think it's such a powerful addition to, to any kind of trading process. I know for me, just another one little thing that made a real big difference in my trading, just around, uh, just maintaining that that a, a gratitude journal, and just being very grateful for having the opportunity to trade. Because, like you said, a lot of people are doing other things, and man, sometimes we're just so lucky to, for to, to be able to do what we do as a trade, and you know, to, uh, to to have the ability to make money for, for you know, just to, to do something fairly <laughs> uh, menial. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's a really good practice. I think I just got done with this book called The Surrender Experiment. Um, author is Michael Singer, and he, okay. it's a really good book. And it's not about trading, but it's about uh, just surrendering to what, kind of, what comes your way in your life and not fighting it. And that's a good mm. parallel to trading about surrendering to what the market's doing sometimes and not, not fighting it because you think, well, I read, these re- I read these research reports. You know, I have this trade I like, and I think it's going to work, and you keep fighting the price action. And yeah. It's so peaceful and so, it just feels so good to submit and surrender to what is going on right now and then realize you can always, there'll always be a moment to get in that trade. And I think uh, from a bigger perspective, if you zoom that line of thinking out, it's the same thing with your life and everything else. It's just sometimes you're distracted, you have people in town, you have, you're sick, you didn't sleep well, um, you you have a a problem with your house or your apartment, whatever it is. And a lot of times it's surrendering to the fact that that's where you are today and that means you trade smaller or you don't trade at all. And I used to blow out and lose money and try to force it. And you just, you learn that that doesn't work. And I think that makes it easier too on, on you. That's great advice. Just having the, the wherewithal and the awareness that there's things going on in your life that could affect your trading is such a big, big thing if you, if you catch those things um, at the right time. So what do you see, you know, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see traders making? Like the folks that you used to work with at the, at the prop firm, uh, just other traders that you, you mm-hmm. talk to, what do you see as, you know, the kind of the biggest or the most common mistakes that people make? Yeah, I can break it down to a few, uh, few big ones that are, I think they're, anybody can overcome these, but one of the first ones um, I'll say is not adapting, unwilling to adapt, especially when you're having a little bit of success, mm-hmm. unwilling to adapt to, maybe new technology, new ideas. You should always be very curious. Um, Pete Sampras, the tennis player, they, uh, he had an interview recently, and uh, you know, he had a great career, one of the all-time greats, and he said yeah. one of the biggest mistakes he made that he wishes he could tell his younger self was that 
they came to him, um, I think, in the middle of one of his good runs where he had won a bunch of majors and said, hey, there's new rackets that have a bigger head, gives you more uh, margin for error, there's better strings. This stuff is coming. You should be trying it and using it. And he thought, you know, no way. I don't want that. I want my same racket. I've won all these titles. And he was very stubborn. And he says if he would have switched, that technology changed the game. Basically right. took away the ser- serve and volley game, and now guys are on yeah. the baseline. And he said, yeah. if I would have adapted that technology while I was doing well, in the middle of my career, I think I would have extended my career and won a lot more majors. Instead, mm. I got stubborn and was forced to do it late at old age, and all the young guys came up and they were using that technology, and it was, it was, you know, they were catching up to him. So I think that's, yeah. one, that's one big lesson. The second one, more specific to trading, is everyone wants to pick the turn in the market. They want to buy the bottom and sell the top. And yeah. they want to, and I just think, let the market play out. Let it put in that failed low or failed high, and get that meat in the middle. You know, get the catch the catch the one that's. You don't have to pick the top and the bottom. How much money do we lose trying to be perfect? And I think, sitting back and be w- willing to give up a move and catch a different part of it. I think that that it's very hard to do. It's against human nature, but. I think over time it really is a rewarding thing to be able to miss and move. Huh. So that, that's, that's, what do you think it is about human nature that wants to try to pick bottoms and, and call tops? Is, is it an I ego you thing, you be, think? Yeah, somehow it is. I think you want to be rewarded, especially when you, you research or you think you have an idea that uh, you like. Everybody, everybody wants to be, it's gone down too far, so I'm going to buy it, or I have these levels here. And the problem is the markets, there's a lot of herd mentality in the market. and Everybody's doing the same thing at the same time. So you have these huge moves. And a lot of times the move isn't fundamental. The move is because everybody is doing the same thing you're doing and they're caught the wrong way. And it's not going to turn until they get out. And a lot of times you're caught in that with them. And I think, you know, so that would be number two. Number three would be a really strict risk management plan. I think now more than ever that's important because the opportunity a little more difficult, I think, to make money with so much computerized trading. So I think one thing that you can do to combat that is trade a little bit less. And, you know, if I have a bad start to the day, I'll cut my size in half. And then I have numbers that I use, and then I'll cut it in half again. And then at a certain point, I quit. And if I start doing well after I've cut my size that day, yeah, I don't make all my day back. Maybe I make half that back. But the next day, I have that momentum. And my right. reason day wasn't, wasn't as bad, and I build on that. And in the long run, it means I don't blow out. It also means I can trade bigger because I trust myself to cut back. And that's been really important. And for many years, I, didn't, I did pretty well not even doing that. I imagine how, how much better I could have done if I would have done that. But now, you know, mm-hmm. I've been forced to do that because it's just been something that has made a lot of sense. And so where do you think the what's, – what's the state of the, you know, of – uh, of the, what do you think the state is for the, the the discretionary trader? You know, we talked about the you know, the algos coming in and kind of the the overwhelming presence of algos nowadays in the markets. Where where is that place now for the discretionary trader? Do you think that there's a long future for the discretionary trader, or what's what's your opinion on that on that subject? I think I think the discretionary trader is getting squeezed by technology, just like mm. most other most, most other businesses are. I think. Really good discretionary traders will always be around. Um, I think marginal discretionary traders might get pushed out unless the market gets a lot busier and looser. So I think as a discretionary trader, you need to be better than ever at risk management. You need to hammer out the stuff that you like and you need to wait for it. Um, If that means semi-automating your signals to wait and not do stupid trades in a range or something, which, you know, we all do. But I think ultimately what you're seeing is in, in, the, in the currency markets, what you see is uh, <clears throat> banks trading with each other on their own private books, and then the futures right. books and some of the other books are thinner with less volume because they're thinking, I, I want to cut out all the computers, you know, the algos, the noise, and I just want to trade directly with the other big money players. And you, couldn't, yeah. you can't blame those people. I believe that that's happening more and more in the stock market, equity market as well, where you're seeing in the treasury market where the, these cash markets and with all the ETFs and stuff in the stock market, you're getting less volume and more, you know, strange movement in the futures because a lot of the big players are trading with each other. They're trading on different exchanges. They're trading cash products because these high leverage futures products are getting so gamed and computerized that these people are leaving. So 
it, it doesn't mean I'm not painting a negative picture. I think there's always going to be those markets. There's always going to be money to be made in them. I just think it's gotten a little tougher because of all the fragmentation and yeah. also the, the cycle we're in at the zero rates. I think when we get off zero rates, data will matter, stories will matter, and we're going to have stuff to do again. I just think yeah. that it might be a little harder than it was before, but it's still going to be there. Yeah. No, that's, that's, a, that's a great take on things. So let's just change directions for a second. So let's, let's talk about, you know, how you kind of uh, cut your teeth. So um, how long did it take you, to, would you say, to, be, to get to a place where you became comfortable with your trading? So by the time you started with your prop shop, uh, prop firm, how, how long did it take before you could say, yeah, I was, you know, I'm, I'm consistently profitable? Um, probably like six months to eight months until um, I was making money and profitable, and I think my first, like, two or three years, you know, I did pretty well, better than I would do at a normal job, but not, not, not huge money. And then it was, like, years four and five got a lot better, and then it was, like, years seven, eight, nine, ten were just way better than the previous years. It took me, mm-hmm. you know, it was a combination of the market. It was just, like, I was getting the skill set I needed at the same time that the market started picking up. Uh-huh. And, you know, that it takes... And it takes time. I mean, you can you can do very well in you know in a few years, but I think realistically, you need to give yourself two or three years. Um, but then to really become proficient, um, you know, it takes five, six, seven, eight, nine years. And uh, I think that that's people might not want to hear that, but that's that's the truth. I mean, it. But again, I, I made good money in my first two or three years, more than I would have had a, a regular job. So it wasn't a bad thing. It was just. It took time, and you know now I work less hours and probably do better than I would have in the beginning with, you know, three times the hours. But that's just because you learn, you trade a little bigger, you're better at risk management, you know, you understand how to be aggressive at the right times, and that's part of the learning curve, and that's part of the, you know, the experience factor. Yeah, and to be fair, you're also involved in one of the most one of the most complicated markets. Not complicated in the sense that it's, um, you know, hard technically, but you know, one of the most performance. Uh, I guess, yeah, performance required activities when kind of intraday trading, um, the futures. Um, do you think it's easier for, let's say, a swing trader or just can become competent or do you think that kind of learning process still takes, you know, two to four, six years? What's your take on that? Um, I couldn't say for sure because I never, I do do some swing trading, but I have not that much. I would never say one type of trading is easier than another because I feel like it's mm. just not the case. Because if it was, we would all do, we would all trade. Stocks. <laughs> right. We would all, we would all swing trade and we'd be millionaires. So I think that, yeah. I think it's equally difficult across all spectrums. I think you gotta, you gotta stick to your, you know, if you're part time trading, you're gonna swing trade. If yeah. you have an environment where you have resources and people around you and you know, you need a lot of leverage, then you trade futures. And that's, that's the situation I got put into, I, I put myself into. And that's why I chose it. And I've kind of learned that way and I've used those skills. But to some extent, trading is trading. And I think you can pass those skills on to another market and you can learn, um, you know, because the logic of how to think is very much the same. The problem-solving mindset is very much the same. It just takes some time to understand, you know, it's kind of like being a computer programmer. You might not know all the languages, but once you know a couple, you can move to other ones a lot faster than if you didn't know any. So right. I think that would be very much similar with trading. Um, you know, not I'm moving best. towards yeah. a little right, and I'm moving towards a little longer-term strategy myself. You know, day trading. I used to trade maybe 30, 40 trades a day, and now I'm probably trading four to ten. Yeah. You know, sometimes I go all day and I make one trade or zero trades if it's slow, and that is unheard of for me before. So it. That's me adapting right now to what I have in front of me. Yeah. And that analogy before about, you know, just kind of comparing trading to, to learning a, a computer language or a language, that's a great analogy because once you have the belief that you can do it, then there's no reason why you couldn't learn something else, right? So, so that's a great yeah. mentality just to, to keep, yeah, to have. Yeah. Right. And I think part of the answer to the question you asked about different products and time frames, the answer is, yeah, there are some things that are easier, but they keep changing, so you don't really know what they are. I mean, yeah, it might be a yeah. better stock, stock trade for a couple of years or a better currency trade for a few years, but it's not always that easy to – and if you keep jumping around, you're, um, 
what's the saying? Uh, jack of all trades, master of none. Master of none. Sometimes yeah. that can that can be a problem too. So it's it's you know it's sticking with something, but also not being stubborn. It's it's an interesting mix. So yeah, it might be easier somewhere else, but it's not as simple as everybody going there and just making a bunch of money. Right. Right. And so what advice would you give then to, let's say, a, a struggling trader, someone who's been doing it for a while and just can't seem to, you know, catch that break? Well, make sure you have a few years of income, at least two years of income um, that you can, ha- you can live on and, and consider, you know, think about making no money and being okay with that. Um, and then after that, look at uh, trying a lot of new things if you're new to see what what you can do, like if you have other obligations, you're going to need to be a part-time trader. Maybe you automate some stuff. You swing trade. That's going to make more sense for you. If you have an engineering mind or a computer programming mind, maybe you look at quantitative trade. Um, if you know you want to be a discretionary trader and you have the time, you have to look at what happens. The question was a struggling trader. Well, I mean, any, even a successful trader is eventually going to be a struggling trader. I've been a struggling trader many times. And when yeah. that happens... It means back to the drawing board, um, what's been working, what's not been working. Um, you know, look at the big moves. Is there any way you could have seen them coming? How are they, you know, are, are retracements working? Are technicals working? Is it more of a news-driven market? Do you not understand what's going on? If so, can you reach out to some people that, you know, have you made some contacts and see who's having success? That's kind of the you know, project you can go through when you're really struggling. And then once, once you get a little information, then it's time to close off the information flow, cut your ties, and start, start just doing trading yourself. You know, if you're day trading, you can record your screen. You can watch order flow, rewatch big moves, and start to put it back together again. And then when, when you start hitting a few singles, you move the size up, and then hopefully you go on a run, and then you repeat the process again. That's kind of trading in a nutshell, really. Yeah. Now you really laid out the journey really, really well there. Um, from having that kind of level of self-awareness to do the internal inventory with what's going on, then reaching out to other people and having that social aspect and refocusing back on oneself again. And then, you know, like you said, adding size and kind of repeating that process. So it's, it's, I, like, I love that, the way you, journey, you just uh, talked about the journey there. So I mean, it just seems like to me... Thing, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to add one more thing. It's just that, it's that when you're going through all this stuff, it, it's very painful. I, I mean, it sounds simple, but it's not simple. It's really yeah. emotionally gut-wrenching sometimes and it could last like I've had six month periods where I've made no money. It's very difficult. I mean yeah. uh, make money, lose money, make money, lose money, you know, or go on a great run and give it all back. And you know, that yeah. happens. It happens to everybody. So it's that's why the risk management is important. And you might feel like total crap about what's happening, but if you protect yourself, you're not blowing out financially even though you feel horrible emotionally. And yeah, right. sometimes you're gonna feel Sometimes you'll lose a lot of money when you're doing well and you won't feel that bad emotionally, but you probably should because you lost a lot of money. But then when yeah. you're struggling, you're losing a little bit of money every day and you feel terrible emotionally, but really you probably shouldn't feel that bad because it's tough and you're doing a good job of managing your risk. So your right. emotions don't always make sense in that regard, so you've got to be aware of that. That's really well put. So it seems, like, you know, maybe I'll, uh, it seems to me that when I've heard you talk and you know, we've chatted before, you seem to have a really calm demeanor. Now, is that a correct characterization? Have you always been that way, or did you, did you learn to be learn how to be calm? Um, no, that's not. I mean, I used to be. I was never wild and crazy. I don't think. But at the same time, <laughs> yeah. I, I would get very worked up about just you know, the gut wrenching swings, and and the people who know me would would agree. I would. It would definitely impact me at night. It would impact me. Mm-hmm. You know, I would just want to go home and take a nap and. And I have really turned the tables on that. I, I have changed that about myself, and I've worked very hard to change that. And I think the, the meditation has really helped. It's just those breaks during the day, the silence, mm-hmm. the thinking about, you know, in the book, The Surrender Experiment that I brought up, he talks about how we're on a planet spinning around in outer space in a galaxy, in which case there may be millions of galaxies that we don't even know. And then look at us on that planet in some state or country. Think about how small... We are relative yeah. to the whole. And then yeah. sometimes that, that kind of calms me down a little bit. Like, okay, pal, get over yourself, you know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's really a big, mysterious game that we're playing here, and don't take it too seriously. And that, yeah. that started to make, that's kind of what 
I've had a shift for some reason. Um, and I think it's because of the intent I had to make that shift, and it's helped. That's beautiful. Just seeing sometimes how maybe we're not the center of the universe, right? Can really shift right. the way we perceive the present. So, talk to us more then about your routine. So, you know, we started talking about it before a little bit, but uh, do you have like a morning routine or some sort of daily ritual that you do before, you know, you hop to your trading desk? Yeah, um, in the morning I'll, I usually get up, I'll do um, a meditation, 30 or 40 minutes, and then I will make myself breakfast, and then, then I'll go up to my screens. I like to check out the academic calendar to make sure I know what's coming out, what's going to be a surprise, what are the expectations, and then you know, I'll browse through Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, um, Bloomberg is a f- good free one, uh, Business Insider, uh, Twitter, and just figure out what's everybody talking about, what happened overnight. It's not necessarily going to make me money, but you need to be aware if there's headlines. You just need to be aware of what's going on. Um, mm. So I get that awareness. So I feel like, I under- okay, I understand why we're up or down. I understand what people are focusing on. And then after that, it's look at the products I'm going to trade from a bigger time frame, like daily or 60 minute, then work okay. my way down and then get the levels that are important. So kind of have a handle on that. So now I feel like fundamentally and technically I kind of, you know, I kind of understand what's going on. And then yeah. after that, it's, it's sit down. And usually just from doing this for a long time, I start to get some scenarios. You know, if this happens, then I'll try this. If that happens, I'll try that. And then during the day, I see, and you know, I'm hopefully waiting for some of these scenarios. And then if they play out, I kind of have an idea of, you know, what I'm going to do. And a lot of times I gave some examples about the Iran uh, oil deal and the unemployment report that, you know, the stock market went down on and I traded bad. And I give a few examples, but a lot of times those yeah. things will come to me during the day, you know, based on preparing technically and fundamentally, I'll be able to react to those uh, breaking news stories with some scenarios that I've already thought about. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. And so I'm curious, so how, do you, how else do you take care of your, of your, uh, your biology? So you do the meditation in the morning. Um, how are you feeding yourself in the morning? Are you having a big breakfast, something small, some coffee? <laughs> I'll be a tricky here. What are, you, what are you doing? Yeah, definitely. I'll have a small cup of coffee in the morning. Uh, yeah. Breakfast, I usually have like, you know, oatmeal, um, not a lot of sugar in it usually, just big, kind of basic oatmeal, walnuts, yeah. whatever, something like that. Um, some, bring some water up on my trading station. I have a standing desk, so I like to stand. Oh, nice. I mentioned I go for walks and stuff during the day. Um, yeah. A lot of times, too, this might sound counterintuitive, but I like to distract myself during the day. Maybe even huh. I used to watch the TV series uh, with no volume in the corner or just really low volume where I'd watch Why is that? Video. Because a lot of times I know what I want to look for, but the problem is I get sucked in and trading things I don't want. So mm-hmm. I'm always watching the market, but if I have a small distraction, like a project, maybe I'm online and I'm trying to, you know, I don't know, I had a house project the other day, so I was looking up like, materials to fix something in my house. And, yeah. and it sounds, sounds crazy, but that little distraction keeps me out of the market until I know I want the market to pull me in, like when, I, when one of my scenarios gets hit. Uh-huh. Or, and then I tend to make good trades when I get pulled in, but when I force myself in, I tend to make poor trades. So it's just really busy. You know, I'll be focused all day. This isn't an everyday thing, but when it's slow, yeah. there's not more than a couple trades a day to do. So, you know, that'll help. Interesting. And so uh, for, your, for your breakfast, are you eating the same thing every day or do you, uh, are you one of those per- people who are like, yeah, I eat the same thing every day for breakfast or do you vary it up all the time? Yeah, it's funny because my wife likes the variety and I, I like, you know, I like to eat a lot of different foods, but for breakfast I pretty much eat, I mean, I'm, I'm, I change bananas to berries to walnuts. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But generally speaking, I, I eat oatmeal every morning and, you know, sometimes I go on a different run where I'll have a smoothie with some, you know, coconut milk, almond milk, some fresh vegetables. I'd check in there, some carrots, uh, maybe like half a banana, some ice cubes. I'll do that sometimes yeah. too. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, pretty pretty healthy um, for the most part. I don't subscribe to any specific diet. It's more of like not a lot of red meat, not a lot of dairy, you know, a little sugar if I can. And then, of course, I, I cheat, you know, like everybody on vacation weekends. But yeah. I try to uh, do that. For, for local vegetables, uh, fresh seasonal vegetables, that kind of thing, fish nice. at night once in a while, that kind of diet, nuts. Yeah, that's very nice. And, and so at lunchtime then, um, 
I can. I know one time you and I caught up, and you literally were walking around for an hour, like you said before. You'll walk for like an hour just to clear clear your head, get some exercise in. Um, does uh, he's mentioned you when you do that? You, when you come back to your training, does it take you a while to get reconnected again, or are you just like, oh, my mind's clear, I can see more, I can see, you know, things more, things more clearly now. I'm ready to, you know, to, to get be active again when I when when I need to be. Right. Um, well, if I think something's going to happen, I'll stay and I'll skip it if I'm looking for something. Yeah. But, like, generally speaking, like, there's a few ways to answer that. Are, it, the most activity I do is going to be in the morning when the U.S. and Europe are open together. So mm. I'm usually going for a walk when European cash markets close and it's around 11 to 12 central. And yeah. it's usually pretty dead. And if it's, I have my phone with me and I, have a tra- I use TradeStation for charting. So they have a great mobile app, real-time quotes. So I'll check stuff. And I'll kind of see where everything is. And gotcha. sometimes I'll miss a nice trade. It happens. But yeah. I'm thinking, okay, over the next 20 years, am I willing to miss two nice trades a month to be able to walk every single day and add that element to my life? Yeah. Absolutely. So that's like, you know, I'm going to miss stuff, but I'm not missing the prime stuff in the morning. I'm missing stuff that, you know, is okay. And it might be good one day and I might miss something big. But, I mean, you have to decide, like, for – if I'm going to do this for a long time, I need to make a lifestyle practice. And I'm going to, if, if you're never willing to miss any move, then you should just be single, trade 24 hours a day, and not do anything else. <laughs> you know what right. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well said. <laughs> and uh, so how do you, uh, do you have like a post-market routine that you uh, go through after everything's said and done? Yeah, I, I cut out charts so with like a little screen cutout tool and I write notations during the day about, you know, where did the data come out and I mark it on the chart, how did the market react and I, I circle areas that I liked and I, I post those to Microsoft OneNote and then I tag them um, with, you know, certain tags I have if I like to trade so I can go back and search them later. Um, so I do that at the end of the day. I just Because I'm going to train my brain to do the things that I want to do, not the things that... Mm. I did wrong. In the beginning, I used to plot all my trades by hand. I'd spend an hour every day, and I would beat, you know, I, you'd see red ink and blue ink in this little range where I'm beating myself up. But that doesn't do me any good because I already knew I screwed that up, and now I'm spending all my time at night, and you're actually subconsciously reinforcing yourself to do the Yeah, you're reinforcing that. Right. Right, so I've learned that. I just ignore that, and the next day I look at what I wanted to do. And that, sorry, I look at what I wanted to do that day, even if I didn't do it, the next day, the odds of me doing the right thing are way higher, and I've had success with that. So I read these articles, productivity articles, and people say, we need to keep track of all your mistakes. And right. I, I used to, I used to, I'm a diligent person. That's what I used to do. And I, I, I don't think I, I think you need to be aware, obviously, of things you're doing wrong. So don't, don't get me wrong here. But at the same time, I don't leverage your strengths, focus on what you want to do as a more effective approach than chronicling all of your mistakes, especially when you're newer you don't know what you're doing that much, so don't go over your mistakes too much. Let's find what works. Yeah. Yeah, sort of don't focus on what you don't want. Focus on what you want, right? Right. Look at how, where were the good trades? Where were the trades that you wanted to do? Let's study those. And the more yeah. you focus on that, you're less apt to do other stuff. And that's, it's counterintuitive, yeah. but it's one of those little tricks that it's worked well for me, so I'm just going to stick with it. Yeah, I think I, I actually do a very similar thing, but it's, I think we're, it works well because you're kind of training your brain to, you know, for a positive outcome. You want, you know, you know what to happen. Um, and, you know, you're just training it over and over again to, to, to see it play out. And if you, if you do the opposite and you train your brain <laughs> looking at those negative events, then, you know, you're going to create those, that same firing pattern. You know, we're, neurons up and fire together, wire together. So, I think that's why it works to focus on the positive versus the negative. That makes a lot of sense. I so, had a, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I just had a good friend of mine who's a real fantastic trader, and that is, that's one of his main pieces of, of advice he gave me a few years ago. Um, I think I was having a kind of a bad run at some point. We were talking about the market, and that's what he said he did. He just kind of said it off the, you know, off the cuff, and yeah. it wasn't really... You know, and I really stuck to that, and I thought, whoa, that's interesting, And because I'm always trying to, you know, you always read, you need to know every mistake you make, and you need to make sure you don't make them tomorrow, and you got to be careful with that. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's such an amazing journey, and I, and I know you've really gone down this path a far away, Brad, is that kind of journey of self-awareness, like, you, it sounds like, you know, you've created some really strong intentions, intentions around how you want to live your life, 
how you want to approach your trading and and uh, you know just 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 shows um, in the way you know the discussions unfolding here today but I know we're running low low on time now so I'm just gonna maybe just uh, uh, shoot a few more questions to you sure and um, before we wrap up so let's take it back to that Pete Sampras uh, quote that you that you said earlier um, he asked you know what would he, advice would he ask his or give his younger self so I'll turn that on you what advice would you give your younger self now if you could say you know look back at the at the you know the, the 20 year old Brad or you know 21 year old Brad what would you tell yeah. him that's a that's a fun question to answer you know, I haven't I haven't been asked that before I think the very first thing that comes to my mind is just to, for God's sake, take it easy on yourself. <laughs> I'm so hard, so hard on myself. I just, uh, I worked my, I just worked myself into the ground um, to be so disciplined about everything I did, and I thought that was the way. I, I read a book on Roger Federer. I used to play tennis, and he said something very similar about how he was so hard on himself, a perfectionist, and he thought mm-hmm. that was the way to success. And, and he was around 25, 26 years old, and he was doing pretty well but he exploded when he was like 27, 28, 29 yeah. um, when he totally stopped doing that. And you think that you have to do that to be successful, but when you take yeah. weight off yourself and you make it a game and you allow yourself to do other things, you all of a sudden realize that you end up being more disciplined and spending more time. It's just, it's, it's, you're free and you're loose. And it would be, that would be the biggest thing for me is just to not, don't go so hard at it. It doesn't mean you don't work hard. It doesn't mean you don't work the same amount. It just means you work differently. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Maybe right, next question. I'm done. Yeah, I think as traders, we're kind of wired to <laughs> to to want to do right, to try to do as much as we can. Um, but sometimes you got to slow down to speed up, right? Right. Yeah. All right. So, how? Here's another question. Who would you consider successful, whether it's in trading or you know just in life? If you look around, uh, you know. Yeah. You mean people, or do you mean like how would I consider one to be successful at their craft? Uh, let's say people. Um, so if you look around, you know yeah, around your social network or wh- wherever, who do you look up to or, ins- or inspires you? Um, there's a couple of friends I have, um, you know, that I've traded with. Dan Rudman, Brent Nord are two guys that you know that I've grown up trading with that have an excellent balance on. And nobody will know who they are, but they have an excellent balance of life and trading, and that's kind of where I picked up a lot of these, of these, uh, these, this idea of the whole life, not just the trading life. And yeah. in terms of people, others would know would be Ray Dalio. I don't know him personally from Bridgewater. He runs a large hedge fund. Uh, you may have heard of him. He's in the news a lot, yeah. and uh, it seems like he's managed to trade successfully, build a business successfully, and do both on a big scale and that's just to me and I don't know that guy personally but that just sounds like an incredible accomplishment um, yeah and, and, and the, the last person would be the author of the book I just read Michael Singer he wrote The Untethered Soul which is a New York Times bestseller and also The Surrender Experiment and this guy basically had a goal in life which was to lose his his personal preferences and kind of go with the flow of life and he asked for that every day and it, Life gave him so many experiences to test that. It was one thing after another that he wanted to fight, but he had to just kind of surrender to it. And when he did, he found out that it, it led him in another direction that he didn't expect. And it's about not being rigid about what you think you need to be doing. And instead, you know, you'll see in your life that things tend to kind of push you a certain way, and you should embrace that and move in that direction as opposed to digging your feet in and kind of fighting that. And because sometimes things play their course. Like when I left my firm, I, have a great, I had a great firm, great relationship. I loved it. There was nothing wrong with it. But I just felt like life was telling me inside for about a year, you need to go on your own. You need to just do this. And, uh, you know, I didn't if, – if, and I felt – it was hard at first, but I felt, I felt good doing that. I feel good doing that. And I guess that's kind of my goal. And to me, if you listen to the messages and the things, the signs and the people that come into your life, you'll live a smoother life because you're not fighting what is you're going with it. And that, that's kind of the lesson that I'm working with right now. And that nice. would make me feel successful if I'm able to do that. Nice. That's beautiful and really sage advice, sage guidance. Um, but I can't let you off the call, though, without asking. So what kind of meditation do you do? Is it like Vipassana, the TM? What's your Yeah, what's your it's, I mean, meditation types, it seems like there's as many of those as there are exercise types or trade styles. <laughs> right. So, 
the Pashana is what I do, and I don't think it's necessarily the best or the only way. The, only, the reason I do it is very simple. is because they had a structured 10-day retreat um, in many different cities, so it was really easy for me to go there and do a 10-day retreat yeah. in silence, and I couldn't yeah. find anywhere else. So I went there because that's what, the, that's what was available to me. So I think I'll, I'll continue to dabble and see what's, what's perfectly best for me. But the one yeah. piece of advice I had, probably it goes with training and with meditation, is eventually you need to dig a well because if you need to go 100 feet to get water and you dig 10 wells that are 10 feet deep, you get no water. So eventually mm-hmm. you need to dig, dig 100 feet and get to the water. So that would be if you keep trying a different training style and you keep trying a different yeah. spiritual practice, you eventually don't get deep into anything and you don't get anywhere. So I just decided to go for something. And then I can always change, but that's the starting and stopping for five oh, years. At some, point, at some point, you gotta, you got to go with it, you know? Yeah, go deep. I love that. What a message. I love that. All right, just uh, two more questions. So number one, number one is, um, I, know we just, I know we're on the meditation theme here. I know you have some ideas. Like, why is it that you think that uh, meditation has just become so popular nowadays? Like, you know, Ray Dalio obviously meditates. Um, mm-hmm. Meditation seems to be like what successful people are doing nowadays. What is it about meditation that's kind of drawing everyone to meditation? I think that, I mean, this might sound kooky, but I think as, as a big collection of human beings we're going there's more of a spiritual transformation going on and you know think about there's still people who are you know killing people all over the world and there's parts of the world that that are very much ugly in a lot of ways when it comes to how we treat other humans but Mm -hmm. i mean if you look at how things used to be we seem to be evolving you know and i think we're moving more and more into the fact that we're all connected and you have a life is really hard being a human is really hard you have a compassion for other people and for what we all go through. And I think meditation is kind of that next step to, to go into silence and be connected with, with how it feels to, to tap into that. And I think especially successful people like Ray Dalio, who have a lot of financial resources, get to the point where you can't really, what are you going to get from earthly possessions or material? You know, what, what is he going to get from that? He can buy whatever he wants. So I think he, then you move into the spiritual realm and you realize what if I can stay happy regardless of what I have or what I don't have? And you start to kind of go for that next level of achievement. And I think that is a spiritual thing. And then the meditation definitely helps the trading because you're calmer and you wait for your stuff. And, you're, you know, but I think successful people tend to get into it because it's the next evolution. But that isn't always true. But, you know, it is true for some. And um, I just think as a human race, it's, you see more of this now than ever before, and that's a really good thing. It just makes, I think it just makes people kinder and more aware. And I mean, everybody who starts doing that, everybody else benefits. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a great place to wrap it up. So, so Brad, um, tell people, where, you know, where can they find out more about you? Uh, what are you up to now? Anything else you want to share with the audience? Yeah, sure. Um, the f- personal friend of mine, Anthony Crudelli, who emailed me, uh, not emailed me, who interviewed me on uh, CME Futures Radio, I um, am with his company, Lodestar Trading Community. And what I do is put out an evening letter uh, after the market closes where I take these screenshots that we talked about and I put trades that I saw during the day. He also has a live trading room for people who are more actively day trading. And I'm in there talking during the day, kind of pointing out things to people. And he's actually on the mic talking. I'm, I'm doing a lot of typing in the room. So I've joined up with him and started doing that. And it's been awesome for me to connect with more people. Um, now that I'm on my own, I, I can, I've gotten so many emails and I get to talk to people. And that's been awesome for me to just, just I don't know, share the experience with people, I guess. That's my main goal. Yeah. And the website is uh, lodestartc.com, L-O-D-E-S-T-A-R-T-C.com, trading community stands for. And, yeah, you can find me on there, and uh, that's probably the best place. And you can – I think I have a link to a bio and an email link on there that they can find, too. Cool. And I'll post all that in the show notes. So, Brad, right. again, I just want to thank you so much for your time today. I wish you the best luck on your continued trading journey, and look forward to seeing where you, know, where, where you go next. Yeah, we'll keep in touch. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brad. All the best, man. You, too. Thanks. Take care. Houston. Take care. You 
You've been listening to the Trading Edges podcast. We've taken this interview and summarized all the big ideas so that you can take action. Just head over to the tradingedge.org slash podcast to find the show notes, transcript, resources, and to continue the conversation. Thank you.